Some years ago, I went to a conference of law teachers in Tasmania and I walked up to the registration desk and for the first time in my life, I was asked this question, how would you like to be described? Not who are you or where are you from, but how would you like to be described? And I thought, oh, well, I'd like to be described as Jim O'Donovan, wit, author and raconteur. That's how I'd like to be described. And this was recorded on my name tag and it was given to me and I wore it proudly at the conference. Every breakfast, lunch and dinner, I wore it. And as I'd meet people, they'd say, oh, you are Jim O'Donovan, the... Oh. And they'd stand back a respectful distance and I'd bask in the glory of this name tag for two whole days. And then I returned to Perth and I unpacked my luggage and the name tag fell out on the bed and I looked down, I was aghast. It said, Jim O'Donovan, twit, author and raconteur. <laughs> So I acquired a name tag and an epitaph in one episode. Now I'm probably the only person in this room who's old enough to remember the Ashes series in which Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson decimated England's batting. They routed them in every test in Australia. And then came the return series two years later in England and the Aussies went on their tour. And when they arrived in England, they were greeted by that robust establishment the Fleet Street Press, and at a press conference, they were peppering Lily and Tomo with questions. And they said to Dennis Lily, Dennis, um, our readers know all about your exploits on the pitch, but they want to know something about your private life. You know, what are your hobbies and so on? For example, what would you do if you found out you had 30 minutes to live? And he said, oh, I'd probably jump the first thing that moved. They were a bit taken back. They said, oh, it's charming. And then they turned to Tomo and they said, and, uh, and Tomo, what would you do? And he said, I'd keep very bloody still. <laughs> now, the trouble with our topic tonight is we're dealing with things that don't keep very bloody still. They move. The classification of the personal property that we're talking about tonight in law is movables. You know, in private international law, we contrast movables with immovables. And when Sir Richard Torrance established the Torrance system of land registration. He was dealing with land. The good thing about land is you know where it is. It doesn't move. And it was a relatively simple system. And of course, we've hoped to have a somewhat similar system dealing with security interests in personal property. And we've been craving such a system since 1992. The first bill in Australia was released in 1992. And now it seems we're getting more serious about it. This debate's been going on for decades. And now we have the second exposure draft of the Personal Property Securities Bill. Thank you. And I guess the threshold question that everyone's asking at present is why do we need a new regime at all? What's wrong with the existing regime? Well, it's simple. There are over 70 acts in Australia dealing with personal property securities. Administered, bless them, by 30 different departments in different states with 40 different registers. It's necessary in some instances to register in different states, the same interest in different states. The registration requirements in the different states are different. Sometimes they're inconsistent, sometimes they're overlapping. It is shambolic. It's just a complex web of red tape. And the new regime, hopefully, will address that problem of inefficiency and duplication. It's also fairly well known what are some of the defects in the Corporations Act regime dealing with company charges. And there's a list of those defects and problems for your attention in that overhead. Fundamentally, it only applies to registrable charges and they're a fairly limited range of charges. It excludes some intangible property. Doesn't apply to all intellectual property, for example. The failure to register a charge under the Corporations Act regime doesn't affect the general validity of the charge. It's affected in liquidation or administration, but apart from those circumstances, the charge remains valid. And this means that a payment to the secured creditor under a, an unregistered charge is valid and effective unless it's a preference. 
So it's valid apart from liquidation or administration. There are no provisions in the Corporations Act dealing with automatic crystallisation or reflotation of a crystallised charge. There's no protection for third party purchases under the existing regime dealing with company charges. And what we need then is a revision of the Corporations Act regime and other regimes applicable to other forms of personal property. We need a new regime that's simple, clear and comprehensive. Now after tonight's discussion, you might wonder whether the rules that were being offered are simple, clear and comprehensive. But let's look at the benefits of the regime first. And the overarching benefit of this regime is its coverage. It's relatively comprehensive in its coverage of personal property security interests. First of all, we'll look at what particular types of personal property are included and what particular types of security interests are included in the regime. The current form of the bill says that it applies to personal property and personal property is defined to mean personal property, any form of property including a licence other than land. That's a pretty broad category, personal property including licence other than land. But you get a, a better idea of the coverage if you look at the shopping list of things that could be covered in this bill. And here's just some of them. Motor vehicles, livestock, crops, office equipment, metal rods, timber, artworks, currency, negotiable instruments, stock in trade, uncertificated shares, bonds, debentures, interest in managed investment schemes, derivatives, options, Intellectual property of all forms, trademarks, copyrights, designs, the lot. Plant breeders' rights, circuit designs, and of course book debts. Now just to give you one example, intellectual property, the value of intellectual property in Australia is estimated at $30 billion. That's an estimate of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Now you will say to me that, well, that's probably covered by security at present through a fixed and floating charge under a mortgage debenture. Well, it might be, but I wonder if the lenders are actually valuing that intellectual property at its full value because they don't know how to value it. They don't know how to track it. And that's part of the problem. So there are, this regime is relatively comprehensive and it covers a broad range of personal property, but it doesn't cover everything. There are some exclusions from the regime. Water rights are not included in this regime. They were originally, but they've been taken out as a result of agreement between the Commonwealth and the states. Wrangle hold over the transfer process, it's highly likely that licence will not be personal property because it's not readily transferable. So that's some idea of the inclusions and exclusions. Generally speaking though, the bill takes a functional approach to what is a security interest. A security interest is defined to be an interest that secures payment or performance of an obligation. And the bill tells us to look at the substance, not the form of the transaction or arrangement. So you don't look at form, you look at substance. And that's illustrated by a Canadian case 